I think the other notable thing that has been very encouraging from my perspective is you're seeing kind of these titans of industry now mentioning Bitcoin as kind of a, a safe choice for investment. That's a huge coup. And you're seeing a departure from the original posture of some of these institutional investors. Uh, you're seeing hedge funds all of a sudden discuss not just kind of blockchain investment, but potential diversification into crypto. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great crypto platform that I've been using since 2018. Uphold has all the top cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and all the altcoins. In fact, they have 260 plus cryptocurrencies on their platform. You can also trade precious metals, stable coins, and 37 fiat currencies. In addition, they are available in over 150 countries. And this platform is fully reserved. They do audits. So you can trust that your funds are safe. No commingling, no lending out your funds. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Catherine Kirkpatrick, who's SIBO Digital's Chief Legal Officer. SIBO Digital is a U.S. regulated exchange and clearinghouse for spot crypto and crypto derivatives markets. Catherine, great to have you on. Great to be here. Uh, Catherine, lots to talk about, you know, as it relates to the crypto industry. It's never a dull day, but let's start <laughs> with your background, you know, where are you from and where'd you grow up? Yeah. So I grew up in the Midwest in Cincinnati and Detroit, went to undergrad in LA, USC, and then went to law school at Notre Dame and then spent my first 10 years in private practice for a large global law firm in New York, and then ended up in that firm's office in Chicago. Um, so I was a partner in private practice for many years. I was kind of a homegrown law firm lawyer doing government investigations and white collar defense. So defending large, primarily TradFi entities in U.S. government investigations, DOJ, OFAC, SEC, you name the regulator. Uh, I advocated on behalf of those entities in, in government investigations and also represented a lot of uh, foreign entities in U.S. government investigations. Until I found my way to crypto. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen? You know, uh, how did, well, I should ask, what was your first encounter with crypto and what was your aha moment and what made you want to go work in the industry? I love this part of the conversation because I think one of the things that I enjoy most in speaking with anybody in the crypto ecosystem is like, what is your origin story? Like what brought you here? And mine kind of happened organically. So I started reading about it and honestly, listening to crypto podcasts while running. And I kind of started intellectually falling down the rabbit hole. You know, the more I read, the more I heard, the more I, fascinated I was with the whole ecosystem, obviously blockchain technology in the abstract, but I had been spending so much time with TradFi, you know, my clients in TradFi and saw some of the inefficiencies there. And so the more I read about crypto and DeFi, the more I realized in the abstract how exciting this was and how potentially transformational it was. And, you know, kind of stepping away from that, realized, wow, there's real value here um, in the purest sense of the thing, like in, you know, kind of offering alpha to retail investors but also just look like the system is imperfect. Like this could bring a lot of improvements. Like let's speed up the trains. Uh, let's embrace this. So I started writing on crypto legal issues because still to this day and, and definitely five years ago or so, um, there's not enough scholarship written about crypto legal issues. You know, you, you can read for days on your classic analysis of insider trading but when you're talking about kind of corporate liability for DAOs, you may get one or two articles. So that's a huge gap. So I started writing and filling that gap intellectually, kind of on my own time, having nothing to do with my billable practice. And then very quickly, that led me to billable work, uh, representing first kind of TradFi and acquisition due diligence into crypto. So is this a good idea? <laughs> is, your investi is your investment going to blow up in your face? 
Uh, and then advising kind of my firm's public companies on the basics of blockchain, even doing some work on kind of talking to 501c3s on like, can you accept donations in Bitcoin or giving people kind of crypto 101, like what is a wallet? And then ultimately representing crypto market participants in SEC investigations. So you do enough of this work, you get, you know, you touch the space, you get more and more excited. It's all you want to do. Right. And then you, I saw, I noticed you spent some time at Maple Finance. Yeah. So that was my first kind of, again, I, I loved it. I wanted to get in it. And what better way to get really in it to become a DeFi GC, <laughs> particularly in 2022. Uh, so I joined kind of at the very end of the bull. <laughs> uh, no one knew it was the end of the bull when I joined. And really, obviously, 2022 was an insane year, particularly for DeFi, for Maple. Maple did really well throughout the volatility. Uh, I think it's an absolutely fantastic protocol, a lot of promise there. Um, but it was it was quite a year in 2022 for crypto lending on an ecosystem-wide basis. So I, I kind of decided to join Cebo Digital because DeFi is one very small part of the crypto ecosystem. Crypto yeah. exchanges are another part of it. And I really liked SIBO Digital's philosophy and SIBO's position. I had followed SIBO kind of from the sidelines in their very strategic acquisitions and growth mode. And I love the fact that they were getting into crypto or touching crypto, because obviously that's not the posture and wasn't the posture at the time of the Erisex acquisition. And I thought, look, this is the future. It's the intersection of crypto and TradFi. Not everybody believes that, and I respect that position, but I felt like that was a really strong place to go, and, and they were really well positioned. So it was an exciting kind of departure and growth uh, for me intellectually. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, Catherine. You talk about your journey, and uh, you know, I think back to when I got into the market in 2016, and it was almost taboo for any of these firms that TradFi to even talk about crypto and no one wanted to touch it. And now things have done a 180. I mean, everybody's lining up. Everyone's trying to get involved. There's mergers, acquisitions and things like that. You know, what are your thoughts on how Wall Street is here and BlackRock and all these guys want Bitcoin ETFs and much more? Well, it's so interesting. You're absolutely right. Like the M&A activity might have slowed down a little bit, but not much. I mean, you even saw that in pockets, like in custody, we're seeing a lot of activity uh, in infrastructure. So that was active even through parts of 2022, which was fascinating. And now it's like tokenization is the flavor of 2023 for TradFi. TradFi is all in on tokenization. I used to joke that Crypto was kind of TradFi's secret girlfriend. You know, you wouldn't introduce her to any of your friends. Like you wouldn't talk about her. But that's not necessarily the case anymore. And I love to see that. I think the ETF environment is fantastic because, look, let's be honest, it's crypto wrapped in a TradFi product. And that's why people can get comfortable. And that's why TradFi is excited about it. But it's a gateway to engagement with crypto. And I'm very excited about any gateway. You know, I love to see the Disney um, Dapper Labs partnership recently. Anything that can get an average consumer or a bank or an investor familiar with crypto, blockchain, wallets, whatever it takes, that's their entry point. And if they have a good experience, it's going to, at the very least, spark their interest in engaging or learning more. And most people, when they start learning more about crypto, I would say it's very rare for someone to start reading and start learning and run for the hills. If anything, it makes them more and more excited. So that's very good for the ecosystem to see the increased engagement, especially when we're still really in crypto winter. Mm. Yeah. And speaking of interest, um, what is SIBO Digital seeing You know, from your institutional clients? There has been reports out there that, to your point, a lot are interested in tokenization. They're interested in the ETFs. Some are launching different products and services. Um, what type of demand are you guys seeing? Yeah. So we've always wanted to position ourselves as obviously a place for institutional engagement, less retail focused. We are always going to be kind of a safe choice for trusted markets. And we've been very conservative in our approach, in our strategy all along. Like you look at our spot market, we have only five 
tokens listed. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's very extreme when you compare us to other crypto exchanges. Yeah. So, you know, we're seeing interest and engagement, hopefully, and hopefully this will continue from entities that might not have the risk appetite to engage with other crypto native entities. They want this diversification. They want experimentation. They want a trusted partner, someone they know where they're not going to get burned, whether it's kind of on the regulatory front or otherwise. So we hope to see continued interest. What's good for crypto is what's good for SIBO Digital, to be clear. And we certainly believe there's space in the ecosystem for a number of different crypto exchanges and clearinghouses and derivatives products, et cetera, to succeed and thrive and grow. Uh, but again, we would like to attract a certain part of the market who wants the SIBO name and wants the very sophisticated, fully scaled legal risk compliance infrastructure that we have in place, which I think is second to none when you compare us to the rest of crypto. Mm. Now, right now in the United States, we don't have full comprehensive regulations. Um, there is some level of clarity, um, but we're still waiting for Congress to move and pass the regulations where the different agencies, CFTC, SEC, and so forth can uh, you know, adapt to that and align with that. Um, so how are you navigating the water, so to speak, of a little bit of uncertainty, um, you know, in the industry, I, obviously Bitcoin has clarity, Ethereum <laughs> has clarity, XRP based on the courts has some clarity, but the rest of the altcoins don't, uh, you know, how, how are you navigating those waters? It's difficult, but we are navigating them very slowly, carefully, thoughtfully, and conservatively. Hi, everyone. Pardon the interruption. I'm Tony Edward, the founder and host of the Thinking Crypto podcast. I have a huge favor to ask you. If you haven't subscribed as yet on YouTube or the podcast platforms, hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, hit the notification bell on the YouTube platform. And on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts, please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast. It allows me to bring great quality content to you. Thank you for your support. And I'll let you get back to the content. Uh, what's really interesting about SIBO Digital is we are the subsidiary of a publicly traded entity. Mm. I don't think people realize how massive SIBO Global Markets actually is. You know, we have all kinds of operations domestically, globally, data, derivatives, securities, et cetera. So our regulators, SIBO Digital's regulators, are the CFTC and to some degree the states. You know, our, for futures, we are a... DCO and DCM, an exchange and a clearinghouse under CFTC jurisdiction. And for spot, we have state money transmitter licenses, we have a bit license, and we're uh, FinCEN, um, you know, uh, part of the United States Treasury money service business. So we're heavily regulated. That was a lot. Right. <laughs> so obviously, we need to stay in good stead with all of the regulators I just named, but also, we are not going to do anything that would upset the SEC, for example. Yeah. The SEC isn't SIBO Digital's regulator, but it's SIBO, other SIBO subsidiaries' regulator. Mm -hmm. So we are taking a more conservative approach because we want to preserve what we view as a really great collaborative relationship with our regulators and SIBO's regulators. A lot of other crypto entities don't have to think about those dynamics. Yeah. And look, it is obviously a dynamic where maybe we've lost theoretical market share because we haven't been able to or we haven't had the appetite to take significant risk. I think that's OK. It's a different approach. Uh, I always say no one really knows who's going to be the Spotify versus the LimeWire at the end of all of this. <laughs> There are a whole bunch of unknown uh, things like potential macro events that could help or hurt entities playing in this space. I still sincerely hope there is exponential growth with engagement of, with just broad crypto as an asset class, which would mean that we could all do well. You know, there's enough of the pie for everyone. And if that isn't the case, frankly, crypto could face serious antitrust considerations in the future, which is something no one seems to be concerned about. But if we see this M&A activity and everything fall within the same two or three entities, that is a potential issue. Um, so, you know, we have a different approach. I think it's a great approach, and I think it's a good approach, particularly for significant volatility. Uh, but we'll we'll see how that works out. <laughs> yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. And you know, I think there's it's it's really important to 
crawl, walk, run, right? And and figure things out. And there's still some level of uncertainty. As mentioned, Congress has not acted yet. Um, but we've seen, I mean, just a lot of craziness happened in 2022, collapse of FTX, Celsius, and so forth. And there's recently Binance settling with the DOJ. You know, what, what are your thoughts on these three major items? Uh, obviously, the biggest being FTX with that collapse. Um, and do you feel the market has matured and, you know, is rising above these things and, you know, raising raising the bar, setting the bar higher? I think 2022 to some degree had to happen. Mm. I hoped, you know, or I hope that it didn't, I wish that it hadn't happened with such severity. But look, crypto is a nascent industry. We're in growth mode. It's very young. So this was part of the broader maturation. And frankly, it likely drove out a lot of projects that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Now, a lot of crypto is severely undercapitalized. So there's going to be collateral damage, smart people, good projects also driven out of business. But that's part of the maturation of an ever evolving, changing, growing industry. And there were a lot of lessons learned. You're seeing more projects invest in legal early on, which I think is a good thing to make sure that those projects, when they ultimately get to the point where they grow enough to gain regulatory scrutiny, they don't have to worry about being in full cleanup mode from the regulatory perspective. Uh, there's a sense of more uh, of a necessity to do in-depth due diligence on counterparties. Uh, there was obviously an egregious overdependence on bad debt. That's not a sustainable approach. So there were enormous lessons learned, particularly from FTX. I think there's been a lot of conversation, or I know me and my other crypto GCs and friends have this conversation. Is this the bottom? Could something else happen that would drive us even lower than we were in 2022? And there was conversation of, okay, well, what about a Binance indictment? Like, is that priced into the market? You know, what if we see UST or USDC lose its peg? Like, what are the what are the other major factors that could really, you know, be the death knell for crypto? I don't think anything would kill crypto as of now. Yeah. I think the Binance resolution is a good thing for the ecosystem because everyone can move on. Everyone can move on. It's clear that there's a path forward for Binance. So arguably, it was a good resolution. I also think it was a good resolution for the government. Uh, you know, I think there were wins on all sides. And obviously, it was uh, hard fought on both sides and in in-depth negotiation. Having experience in government investigations, I think people don't realize how serious a three-year corporate monitorship is. That is a massive undertaking and a significant win for DOJ to have that in place because they are able to ensure that Binance is actually complying with the terms of the resolution. Uh, and, you know, a corporate monitorship is an onerous partnership between the entity and the monitor, which is usually a large law firm, someone with a significant expertise in the issues at hand, compliance, crypto, et cetera. So hopefully Binance will also come out of this improved, you know, new and improved <laughs> Binance 2.0. Uh, and, you know, again, it, it hurt that this all had to happen, but this also happens in TradFi. Like there's DPAs all the time in TradFi. There's significant, there's been bank indictments historically. Oh, yeah. There's been blowups in banks mm -hmm. that, that really make this look relatively minor. So it's not like this is a crypto issue, and I wish there was some sort of recognition there. I think there is recognition for those who are a little bit more sophisticated or viewing this as the kind of long-term view, but we'll see. Yeah, and look, I, I was talking about it the other day, the risking of the crypto industry with the Binance situation. Um, what do you think about this? I, you know, I was talking about it, that the kids – are getting put to bed while the adults are coming in the room, like SIBO Digital, BlackRock, and so Fidelity, right? It seems like that's what's happening. Don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, uh, those kids are going to grow up. Binance is probably going to be on a better footing now, and you have Coinbase and so forth. But FTX, Celsius, Voyager, all these things getting cleared out. What are your thoughts on that? It's good. Go away. Go away, <laughs> FTX. I do not support an FTX 2.0. Yeah. I want all of the wrongdoers and bad actors in crypto to 
exit stage left by don't let the door hit you. You're <laughs> giving the ecosystem a bad name. Yeah. One of the things that has really kept me here and keeps me excited every single day is the, the breadth and depth of talent in crypto. If you look at the crypto lawyers, for example, uh, we're all here, not because we're getting paid more than we were in the private sector. I was getting paid more in the private sector. I can tell you that it's, we're here for the right reasons. Uh, there's a lot of people who are here for the intellectual stimulation, the builders, the developers. I think it's a fantastic um, wealth of talent and really people who are here trying to make the world a better place. Now, should they be permitted shortcuts because they're trying to do that? No, I understand the regulators view on that. Like everybody needs to abide by the rules in place, particularly the the applicable criminal rules, which are really important from the national security perspective, for example. That being said, I think the events of 2022 also maybe made people understand that a little bit of gray hair in the room is not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> You know, boomer is one of the biggest insults that you can throw at somebody in crypto. I, I can say that I'm I'm not a boomer. Uh, but look, like there needs to be a recognition that people who may have like been adults during the financial crisis can bring some wisdom. Uh, I, I think the one of the major benefits Cibo Digital has is we have people who are battle tested. Mm -hmm. We have people who have lived and learned through volatility, through black swan events, through unexpected issues, through engagement with regulators, you name it, they're there, they are able to share their expertise. Um, and that enables us to be more resilient and also to be more strategic and smart in ensuring that our clients, again, have a safe, trusted market to engage with. You mean, uh, you know, a bit of gray hair would have helped Sam Beckman free to not use QuickBooks to have a CFO? <laughs> Yeah, you know, all I can do is shake my head at that. And, <laughs> you know, I, I'm glad FTX is gone because look, yeah. it, it, I find it cathartic, like justice has been served. Yeah. You know, let's move on. I uh, was tempted to follow the trial because again, I did white collar. I, you know, had clients that were indicted. Uh, however, I didn't follow it. Uh, I mean, vaguely, because I was interested in the defense's arguments and from the intellectual perspective, but I was like, this is too triggering. You know, what you did for crypto, I mean, you really hurt crypto. You hurt projects, you hurt fundraising, you hurt the perception of this really fantastic industry. So just go away. I never want to hear FTX again. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, now, next year, Bitcoin halving is coming and, you know, you got these ETF approvals seem to be around the corner. How is SIBO Digital preparing for these uh, two major events? It's really exciting because SIBO is the listing venue for many of the spot Bitcoin ETFs. Mm. So not SIBO Digital, but obviously SIBO Digital is hoping that the ecosystem effect, the real you know, palpable excitement that you're feeling from the potential pending ETF approval bleeds over into broader engagement with you know, crypto futures and spot. So obviously the close involvement SIBO has had with the ETF situation, there's been conversation about, okay, is this going to bring people to digital? Hopefully, yes. So anything that's going to bring TradFi to crypto is potentially good for SIBO digital. That's fantastic. I think the other notable thing that has been very encouraging from my perspective is you're seeing kind of these titans of industry now mentioning Bitcoin as kind of a, a safe choice for investment. That's a huge coup. And you're seeing a departure from the original posture of some of these institutional investors. Uh, you're seeing hedge funds all of a sudden discuss not just kind of blockchain investment, but potential diversification into crypto. You know, anecdotally, I've spoken to wealth managers who they weren't at, you know, recommending that their clients buy crypto, but they're seeing interest in it mm. again from the diversification perspective, a small amount of my net worth. And they're definitely more comfortable in recommending uh, an ETF as opposed to buying individual spot crypto assets. So, all of that I think is good for the ecosystem. SIBO Digital is hyper conscious of anything that is going to affect crypto, like a trickle down effect. 
We are very close to the policy front, and we will often opine on comment letters that may be irrelevant to SIBO Digital's business, but if we view them as particularly bad for some part of, you know, kind of engagement, broader engagement with crypto or um, really having a freezing effect on the ecosystem, we'll definitely consider commenting because, you know, we have a horse in this race and it makes sense to be conscious of the broader engagement and how that can affect your long-term growth as a platform. Mm, for sure. Um, now, there's a lot going on with the SEC and the crypto industry. And, you know, a lot of people are not fans of Gary Genser and what's happening at the SEC is just a mess right now. <laughs> uh, it's, it just seems like this continual drama happening. Now, the SEC took a major loss to grayscale with these judges calling uh, the SEC arbitra arbitrary and capricious in denying the grayscale uh, Bitcoin's spot ETF. Um, one would argue the R Ripple folks took the majority or the lion's share of the victory in that uh, decision. And they're currently in battle with the uh, folks at Coinbase. You know, what are your thoughts here? It seems like the SEC is on a losing track and maybe that may light a fire under Congress to act sooner. I wish there was a correlation between regulatory action and legislation. There is not necessarily. <laughs> I don't think we're going to see crypto market structure legislation for a while. Mm. I, part of that is just the legislators have other priorities and they keep getting distracted. Like look at the daylight savings legislation that had, I think it had Senate approval and then it just died. Everybody got distracted. Uh, they have other things to focus on. Uh, I was very optimistic about the passage of a stable coin bill, but even that's a little bit of a question mark. I think there is a sense, particularly from certain legislature, legislators, that this is an important issue to the American economy or to their constituents. So we'll definitely see additional conversation. There just needs to be that momentum and the momentum needs to be in the right direction. I would rather have no laws in place than a law that kind of is inappropriately broad or narrow or, you know, definitionally, it's incredibly important for if it's going to touch DeFi, for example, what does that mean? If it's going to touch financial intermediaries, who are we really talking about? Like, what is a store of value? Does this cover NFTs or not, for example? Yeah. So I think that this needs to be done right. I am not as concerned as a lot of crypto about all of crypto picking up and leaving the United States. I think there will always be interest, engagement. There will always be a place for crypto here because, frankly, there will always be money here. Uh, there will always be opportunity here for you know digital asset engagement, blockchain or blockchain adjacent engagement. The SEC, frankly, I think that they have a strategy. They haven't lost everything. For example, the library win was a significant win for them. And I think, frankly, some of their lawsuits are very strategic. Like they're covering a lot of ground in different courts with different judges. So I don't actually know how all of, all of this is going to shake out. Um, I'm not as harsh with the commission as many others in crypto in part because when I was a partner at my law firm, Almost all of my fellow partners were ex-regulators, mm -hmm. most of them ex-United States attorneys, so criminal prosecutors, federal criminal prosecutors, but many of them ex-senior level SEC or SEC enforcement. And pretty much all of those people were good people, were ethical people. I genuinely believe most of the people, if not all of the people at the commission, are there trying to do the right thing. Uh, trying to fulfill their mandate of protecting the individual retail investor. I think that it's up for debate as to what the best way of doing that should be. And I think it's it can be a bit confusing for market participants when they're trying to listen to guidance from the different regulators. And I hope to see that resolved because there are certainly a lot of crypto market participants, Zebo Digital included, who were here trying to do the right thing. We're trying to follow the rules. We're trying and hoping to have an open dialogue with the regulators. So that's the biggest issue with all of this is there isn't that open dialogue. Most of crypto is not talking to the SEC proactively and productively. And that is a missed opportunity for crypto and for the SEC. So I hope to see that change. Yeah. And, and look, I, there's also the, 
the Elizabeth Warren, Gary Genser connection and her anti-crypto army. So there is a little politicized thing happening here, but because you also have like Commissioner Hester Parse, Mark Ueda and so forth, who have proposed uh -huh. common sense ideas and working with the industry. But I think there's an issue there with Gary Genser and, and, and I've interviewed quite a few congressmen and so forth who <laughs> they're going after him, the House Financial Services Committee. Um, and, you know, even under his watch with FTX and meeting with Sam Bankman-Fried and so forth. So there's a lot there. Um, hopefully, though, you know, Chair Genser can come to some resolution here, work with the industry to get something out, work with Congress. So hopefully 2024 maybe is the year. I don't know. There's a couple bills in the House, but we'll see what happens. I'm going to keep my fingers and toes crossed for that because, look, again, I'll take anything I can get, whether it's law, rulemaking, precedent. Uh, I think a lot of crypto, uh, I, I'm sad that this has become politicized to some degree. And I'm sad that, that a lot of crypto has this war-like mentality with respect to it's us versus them with the SEC. Because I don't think that's good for everybody. You know, everybody involved, and I'm not even talking about crypto or the regulators, I'm talking about the average retail investor or the average trad by entity that wants to engage. Uh, it would be much easier for them to engage and, you know, be more uh, open to engagement if there wasn't this kind of ongoing fight uh, between the two factions. I always used to say in my kind of crypto 101 presentation back when I was with a firm that if you look at the basic economics like Econ 101, Bitcoin has all of the attributes of a successful currency. Mm. And, you know, things like fungibility and divisibility and, you know, inability to counterfeit, et cetera. However, the one thing it's missing in an important aspect of a successful currency is a clear set of, you know, regulatory guidance where all parties are aligned in their understanding. Uh, so that's what we need to get to the next level of engagement. And we will get there. It's just, I'm impatient along with everyone else. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Fingers crossed that something can happen next year. Um, I don't know if it's likely, but you know, fingers crossed. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stay optimistic. <laughs> me too. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to get your thoughts on NFTs and um, you know, is Cebo looking to do anything there? And uh, obviously, we've seen the artwork and the JPEGs and so forth. That's fine. You know, that's part of the collectibles market, but. The real world applica application of NFTs with insurance contracts and ticket experiences and much more. You know, what are your thoughts on the future of NFTs? I think they're fascinating. And that's a space I haven't been that involved with. When you look at, obviously, there's kind of little sub industries of crypto, one of them being DeFi, one of them being exchanges, one of them being NFTs. Uh, you know, I think. I love the idea of NFTs because they disrupt some of the assumptions that people make about crypto. It's hard to argue that there aren't people holding NFTs for just the sheer appreciation of art, for example. Like, obviously, there's people holding NFTs to as an investable asset, but I genuinely believe there's people collecting NFTs for their galleries to appreciate it as a facet of art. Mm -hmm. And I also love, for example, the concept of NFTs as an amazing entryway for retail investors, for example, like branding, like, oh, you you see the new Marvel movie, you get a Marvel NFT. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm 18, I'm gonna go see it, I don't have a wallet, now I'm gonna down download my wallet to get a Marvel NFT. Well, now I have a wallet, I'm gonna go check out this token. So it's a great exploratory mechanism. I think that tokenization, uh, crypto gaming, um, custody, Crypto custody, those are all great entry points uh, for different pieces of the world. Some of it's obviously crypto custody is a really interesting bank entry point to engagement. Tokenization is a trad by entry point. Crypto gaming NFTs, an amazing retail entry point. So I think that's really interesting. SIBO Digital is, is doesn't have any plans to engage with NFTs at this point. You know, you're not seeing a lot of it with respect to you know, the financial markets or market structure. I think we keep an eye on NFTs again, as to the degree that they affect broader, you know, the kind of the crypto enthusiasm that we're seeing. And I personally love an NFT or two. So <laughs> one of my favorite 
swag gifts I ever received was uh, the the annual Crypto GC conference that uh, I co-chaired from with Rebecca Reddick and, and Greg from Multicoin this year. Last year, the swag gift was they actually partnered with a community of diverse artists. So they asked a few questions about what's your favorite artist, what's your favorite color. They sent a photo of you to an individual artist. The artist actually painted or, or drew people, and then they turned it into an NFT. And then when you arrived at the conference, you had your very own NFT of yourself. Like that's my Twitter avatar. That's cool. So I love it. I think it's fun. Like crypto needs to be fun at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and a lot of the friction that would possibly intimidate, uh, you know, the next billion people, it has to be so easy where you're not thinking about it. I, I don't have to enter like a 24 yeah. letter or character wallet address and things like that. Oh, I forgot my password. I give up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For sure. Which is, as we know, is particularly bad in crypto, if you forget that. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on the metaverse? Um, because, you know, this is not strictly specific to blockchain and crypto, but it will involve that with tokenization and verification and much more. Um, and we see that Meta, they're releasing a really advanced version of Oculus. Apple is working on theirs as well. You know, what are your thoughts on the metaverse and the future of it? I think it's fun. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about the metaverse, and I've noted this because I think it's actually exceptionally important that if you are in crypto, you get out of your crypto bubble every once in a while. Now, some people in crypto, they only socialize with people in crypto. Some lawyers in crypto, they only talk to other lawyers in crypto. And that's actually really bad because you got to get out of the echo chamber and particularly as a lawyer for the purposes of honing my advocacy, I need to always take into consideration the views of people that not only know nothing about the ecosystem and the tech, but are aggressively anti the ecosystem and the tech. So I have a nice opportunity because my husband is in TradFi, he's an investor and he's anti-crypto. Now, I mean, this is a, a source of angst for me. I mean, I've worn him down. I've worn him down to some degree. But he's an amazing check on like in the in the very abstract. I'll say, what do you think of this conceptually? What do you think of this conceptually? And it'll it will enable me to be a better advocate for crypto in kind of understanding and anticipating opposition. And you know the way he thinks uh, as a professional investor is particularly relevant to kind of gauge how the average kind of hedge fund guy is going to think about crypto. I think the metaverse is very difficult for the average person not in crypto to even conceptualize and understand. Like there is a lot of like the metaverse, like, you know, a lot of Scott, like that's ridiculous. What does that mean? It's some video game. And I'm surprised because you say blockchain to a group of hedge fund guys and they, their eyebrows go up. They're like, oh, I want to hear more. I want to learn more. I can understand the use of blockchain technology in the supply chain context, for example, or recording property transactions or eliminating high end wine fraud. Then you start talking to them about, and, and you know, same thing with crypto ETFs or even crypto spot trading or even DeFi. You can, you know, in, in the abstract, you can make them understand some efficiencies. Then you start getting to NFTs and you get met with some skepticism. Then you get to metaverse and you've lost them entire you've lost them entirely. <laughs> so I think meta the metaverse it needs to do some work in attracting more of a mainstream audience for engagement and experimentation. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how we do that, but I love to see some of the growth and some of the more significant partners exploring the opportunities there. There's been some failed projects, for example, again, like Disney's metaverse division, which folded. But I don't think that, that means it's not going to happen. I think it might just be a little bit early for, like, you know, true embrace of everything metaverse. Yeah, to your point, I think still very early. And look, Zuck, uh, he got roasted, lost the billions. <laughs> um, obviously, the, the new Oculus is amazing, but still not ready for i think commercial prime time yeah prime time exactly yeah. but i'm i'm excited i'm on the sidelines like i think there's enormous opportunities there as someone who used to like old school sci-fi books like who knows in a hundred years everyone will live in the metaverse <laughs> <laughs> sure 
Well, definitely. I think the next generation, it's it's going to be easy for them to adopt it. And it, it's going to make sense to them. Many growing up with video games and uh, their lives are on in digital format already. So 1000%. Yeah. And that's going to be so transformational for every aspect of crypto and blockchain. I don't teach my children about checks and checkbooks. I'm, I'm never even going to mention it. But I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old and I talk to them about Bitcoin and I talk to them about crypto. I, you know, buy, I buy my nieces crypto for every birthday and baptism and Christmas. I'm just kind of socking it away and one day it will pay for their college. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I have the same plan for my five-year-old. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> um, want to get your thoughts on CBDCs, uh, obviously governments tokenizing fiat currencies on the blockchain. Uh, there's talks of the digital dollar being worked on by the Fed here in the United States. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? seems like every central bank around the world is looking to build this out. Um, uh, you know, SIBO Digital looking at this, possibly integrating this at some point when they're live, of course. I think CBDCs, it's definitely something we're keeping an eye on. Like no plans as of yet, because we haven't had, you know, no, nothing actionable. I think the interesting thing about CBDCs is they're antithetical to everything that crypto originally represented. Sure. Like one of my favorite use cases for crypto is to talk about the black swan event in the Swiss franc in the FX markets in 2015, where the Swiss finance minister said, we're not going to pull the peg, we're not going to pull the peg. And then they pulled the peg and it caused a massive black swan event in the FX markets. And I'm like, well, that's why crypto exists. You don't have a centralized entity controlling the currency. Uh, and obviously CBDCs, that's not the case at all. That being said, I'm hugely supportive because I think the fact that you have any type of government entity grappling with, like, how do we embrace technology in any of any, in any form? Um, I also think an embrace of CBDCs domestically or overseas is going to be transformational for the embrace of kind of crypto assets more broadly. I think as we see progress there, people will hopefully want to understand the tech behind all of this and how this actually functions, how this works. So that's a great way to kind of expand the ecosystem and the broader engagement. So I, I'm not sure we're going to see any dramatic moves like, you know, launch from the Fed, for example, in the very near term. But I think the more experimentation that we see, the better. And the more embrace we see from any government, whether it's domestically or abroad, from kind of the tech underpinning, any of this is a good thing. Because it's, you know, obviously going to be an implicit or explicit blessing of engagement with all of this technology. Yeah, for sure. And I, I've been on record saying that I believe CBDCs will actually help improve the adoption of crypto. Okay. Um, governments are going to educate people about why this is different than the blockchain. So I think it breaks down exactly. that educational barrier. All right. I got some wrap up questions here for you. First, as we were just talking about the metaverse, if you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? Oh, that's actually a really hard one. Um Oh my gosh, you know what I would create my own metaverse as my, I would take my happy place, which is a little town in Northern Michigan, and I would turn it into my own Shia LaVoy, Michigan metaverse. So, you know, it would be escapism for me, like a vacation metaverse. Because I do think like having been a big law partner and seeing how hard people work in finance, trad and crypto, I think more people need like the ability to de-stress. So my metaverse would be a happy place, like a de-stress, like a relax, like you can't get away on a real vacation, take an hour, come to my metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, and I got some rapid fire questions for you. First is uh, favorite food. Oh, so I'm a, I'm actually a foodie, like 10 years in New York. Oh, that yeah. being said, my favorite food has got to be comfort food, like pasta, warm chocolate chip cookies, and then French fresh fruit. Like I, I could eat, I eat boxes of strawberries every day. It's, it's kind of shocking, actually. <laughs> Good in antioxidants. <laughs> balances, balances out the cookies and the pasta at times. Exactly. Uh, favorite musician or band? All-time favorite band is Keen. Mm. Love Keen. Old school, you know, British, uh, early 2000s peak. But I love classic rock and 80s hair bands. Also have a special place in my heart for Andrew WK. Like if those of if anyone remembers him, which is a is, is a bizarre favorite. Uh, 
But yeah, so I would say eclectic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite movie? You know, I used to watch so many movies, especially because I did, I was a crazy cross-border road warrior. Like I went to Istanbul like 18 times the year I had my first son. So I watched all the movies on all this travel. Now that I have two small children, I rarely watch movies. Like they tend to be animated movies. <laughs> but favorite as of late, like maybe because I was obsessed with this story as a child is uh, the uh, Henry Sugar like short on Netflix. It's everyone should watch it. It's 45 minutes. It's almost like verbatim from the Roald Dahl story. Highly recommend. Yeah, I got to check that out. Uh, favorite book? A Confederacy of Dunces. Mm. I have read that book like a hundred times and it's fantastic and it still makes me cry occasionally. Everyone should read it. It's fiction. I love fiction. I read constantly. I cannot fall asleep at night without reading for at least 10 minutes, no matter how exhausted I am. So I read everything and anything, and I, but I love fiction and biography. Like those are my two jams. Nice. And then finally, when uh, what do you do for a hobby year past then? Um, tennis, uh, running, reading, traveling, and scuba diving. Well, scuba before kids again, but all the uh, all of the above. So you you have to like we all need to get out and touch grass, especially in crypto. So I think some oh. of my hobbies I'm I'm sitting there reading about crypto and listening to crypto, but a lot of it like I think you got to move physically to de stress. You need to get out of your head at occasionally, especially if you're a DeFi GC in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of those things, like I love hiking, running again, uh, those occasional like metaverse esque relaxation techniques. <laughs> Definitely agree with you with crypto and getting out in nature to de-stress. hundred <laughs> percent. People don't do it enough. Get off Twitter. You're having a bad day. Get off Twitter. <laughs> Absolutely. Catherine, pleasure chatting with you. Great insights. Uh, looking forward to uh, future updates around SIBO and love to have you back on in the future as well. But thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. 